We started the series last week with a Jesus encounter. Jesus' own encounter in the water and in the wilderness. And today we launch into a long line of Jesus' encounters. Because we're going to be reading these stories from the Gospel of Luke, you need to know that Luke has a tendency to tell stories in pairs. Today we have Simeon and Anna. There was Zechariah and Elizabeth, who will sing songs of praise, a, a crippled man, and an anointing woman who will be forgiven in front of the Pharisees. There's a man and a woman who will be healed by Jesus on the Sabbath. There is Ananias and Sapphira, Cornelius and Tabitha. And Luke does it. He does it enough that it's hard to think that this is an accident. Overwhelmingly, Luke tells these stories in pairs, on purpose. Now, they don't all say and do the same thing. They don't all have the same function. And yet, these stories stand together to say much about who Jesus is and what life looks like when we follow and so we take today this first pairing, Simeon and Anna. Now, Simeon and Anna are not the same. She has a title. He doesn't. We get her lineage, but not his. They have different names and experiences in life. Perhaps Simeon is even still married. They're not identical, but they sound a lot alike, don't they? Both of them appear in the temple. Both come with a longing anticipation for the redemption of Israel. Both will encounter Jesus as Messiah, and both are overcome with praise. Can you see them there? Overcome with praise there in the temple, which we just need to acknowledge is not the universal experience of all people as they encounter Jesus and the claims that he will usher in. Sometimes we talk about Jesus as if Jesus were so nice, everybody had to like him, and everybody always wanted to follow. But Simon, Simon says as much. He says, Mary... I want you to look at this boy because he is assigned to be the cause of the rising and falling of many. In fact, he will reveal the innermost thoughts. He will be a sign that generates opposition. Not everyone will rejoice as they encounter Jesus and the new way of life that he ushers into the world. Herod, for example, did not rejoice. How many scribes, Pharisees, and religious rulers did anything but rejoice when they first encountered Jesus? In fact, often people of power and influence will backpedal. They'll be threatened. They'll tense up, but not Simeon and Anna. In fact, Simeon says, as he sees Jesus, as he holds Jesus for the first time, he says, I can die now. I've seen. My master has allowed me to see the salvation of the world. I can die now. Anna starts preaching to all who long for the redemption of Jerusalem. But before she proclaims Jesus, she praises Jesus. God. Before she goes to tell anybody else about Jesus, her first response is to praise the Lord. What did Simeon say? Uh, this boy will reveal the innermost thoughts of many, and we get to see their innermost thoughts as well. I wonder, what did Simeon's face look like when he held Jesus? the long-anticipated Messiah. I wonder, did 84-year-old Anna leave her feet? 
did she fall to her knees as she was overcome with praise. I wonder what they looked like. But more than that, I wonder how I might become a little bit more like them. Uh, Simeon and Anna are people who will receive Jesus. I spent a lot of time this week thinking about what is it about Simeon and Anna that makes them Simeon and Anna, that makes them receive the Messiah the way they did. And one of the things that stood out to me as I was looking at this pairing, Simeon and Anna, was the way they received Jesus. Now, I don't know how you picture them, but I, I see Simeon there holding Jesus open hands. I, I see Anna with her hands open in praise. And regardless of what their physical posture looked like in that moment, one thing we know is Simeon and Anna had open hands. You know, you can't hand somebody something if their hands are already full. <laughs> Just like you can't teach me anything if I already know everything. Anybody else have a teenager? <laughs> right, we all were teenagers. You, you can't teach me anything if I already know everything, and you can't hand me anything if my hands are already full. Perhaps that's why receptivity plummets with affluence. The more we have, as a general rule, the less open we are. If I go to hand you a gift, I have a gift in my hands and I want to put it in your hands. If your hands are open and you want the gift, you receive it. Now if you have something in your hands that you determine to be less valuable than whatever it is that I'm going to hand you, you lay it down and you receive the gift. But if I go to hand you a gift, and your hands are firmly fixed on what is already in them. You can't receive the gift that I am offering. And sometimes in life we fasten our hands and our hearts on what we already have. Simeon and Anna had open hands. Herod had his hands fixed on a particular world order and a way of being. In fact, so did many of the scribes and Pharisees and religious rulers. Simeon and Anna had open hands. Anna was 84. You ever wonder what those 84 years held? What they included? Now, we know they included at least the death of a spouse, but... How many people make it to 84 without enduring more disappointment than, than even that? You know, I, I was thinking even just this morning on the way over as I saw a notification about the war in Ukraine, how long the last six months have had to feel if you're living in Ukraine. I mean, it had to feel like an eternity, didn't it? Doesn't it? I mean, it's just... Six, seven months after this war has started. But Anna lived her whole life, 84 years, as an occupied people. 84 years is a long time to hold on to hope. And notice the nature of their hope, Simeon and Anna. Because they eagerly anticipate the restoration of Israel. This is said of Simeon, but it's true of Anna too. We see it in the way she proclaims Jesus. They anticipate the restoration of Israel, and it's going to go beyond that. In fact, Simeon will say, this boy, the Messiah, will be a light to the Gentiles. See, the nature of their hope is more robust. It's, it's beyond our universal longings for personal upgrades. There's nothing distinct about that. I suspect everybody and all of humanity hopes for our own individual circumstances to improve, for my load to be lightened, for the scorecard to be upgraded. But the hope they have, the hope they hold on to, is bigger than their own circumstances. In fact, Simeon knows he's not going to live to see the, all of it as I can die now. Anna, before she preaches, she praises. Both are connected, connected to the Lord in ways 
that we all want to be, and the kind of ways that we hope our kids will become connected to the Lord. It's also worth noting this isn't their first time to the temple. Did you hear what was said of Anna? Anna was there all the time, every day praying and fasting. This is a hope, this kind of hope, these open hands they have, it's the kind of hope that is cultivated over time. Every day, all the time, Anna was before God. And sometimes, I think we want the connection of Anna with the commitment of Arby's. You know, the, the drive through where I'll show up when I want, I'll order what I want, and I'll stay as long as I want. We, we want the connection of Anna, the prophet, these open hands and this connection with the Lord, and yet we want the commitment of the drive through drive-by faith. But this is the kind of hope that is cultivated over time. Anna and Simeon have open hands. With open hands, they receive Jesus. And if we want to look like them, we would do well this morning to pay attention to our hands and what is already in them. What is in your hands? And I'm not just talking about the things that you physically carried into this room, like your phone or your purse, your wallet, but what is in your hands? What are the things that you hold on to? that you find yourself particularly attached to. What is in your hands? I'll tell you one of the things that I've held on to, and I, I don't think I'm the only one that has held on to this idea baked into us in this country, that if I do the right thing, I'll be rewarded in obvious and perhaps quasi-immediate ways. I mean, baked into us from almost the beginning is this idea that we're handed. If I do the right thing, I'll be rewarded. Things will go well. And while I could find a kernel of truth in that, that's not what Simeon tells Mary, is it? No, Simeon looks at Mary and says, a sword will, will pierce your innermost being too. And one of the things that I, I have in my hands is this idea. If I do the right thing, I'll be rewarded. Things will go well. They will succeed. They will blossom. But, but if that's not what Jesus has, if that's not the gift that he's offering, then I have to ask myself, is what he brings into the world better than what I have within my own hands? Do I trust his hands more than I trust keeping things in my own hands? Because you know what? His hands have scars. What is in your hands? And am I willing, are we willing to lay it down for whatever it is the Spirit leads us into? This is the question of trust, isn't it? It's the, the Abraham Isaac moment where you have in your hands a particular way of life and the way life should go and the way you've mapped it out. And then the Lord says, will you... Will you offer up what is in your hands for what I might put in your hands? And we say, I don't know. Am I willing, are we willing, to lay down what is in our hands for whatever it is the Spirit leads us into? And can we just acknowledge, that's really easy to say. Yes, yes, Lord. I want what you have for me. I'll take that. It is really easy to proclaim, and it takes enormous trust when I am particularly attached to what I am holding. Uh, this year, earlier this year, I uh, was introduced and began to explore a, a prayer, a prayer that's often known as a prayer of indifference. And I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, prayer of indifference. What's a prayer of indifference? Indifference is never good, I thought. Indifference is like apathy, and apathy is always bad. And while it's counterintuitive, this isn't really apathy. The prayer of indifference, as it is known, uh, is quite the opposite. It's saying, Lord, I want to prefer what you want. 
I want to prioritize your will over anything that I might prefer or select for myself. I, I want to trust. It's Jesus in the garden saying, I know what I want. I want this cup to pass, but not my will, but yours be done. Lord, will you make me indifferent to anything other than what you want? Your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. It's trust. It's believing that whatever the Spirit leads us to is better than what we might prefer or select for ourselves, preferring God's will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And I see, I thought about that prayer that I began learning about earlier this year, and I thought about Simeon and Anna. Because unlike Herod, unlike the scribes, the Pharisees, and religious leaders who have their hands firmly fixed on what they prefer and the way of life they prefer, Simeon and Anna are indifferent to anything but God's will. Their hands are open. Simeon and Anna are worth emulating, but ultimately you need to know this story is not about Simeon or Anna. It is about the one they announce. The the one they announce, the Messiah who is birthed among us, the Spirit who starts the story. Did you catch that part of the way Simeon is introduced? Luke chapter 2, catch it again. It is the Holy Spirit who rests on Simeon. It is the Holy Spirit who reveals to Simeon that you won't die before you see the Messiah. And it is the Spirit who leads him into the temple. You say, oh, that's great for Simeon. What does that have to do with us? Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your human bodies also through the spirit that lives in you. Did you catch that? The same spirit... It's like breaking news. We just DNA test, archaeological evidence. It is the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that lives in us. The same Spirit that prompted Simeon, that sent Anna on her way to the temple, is alive in us. It's the same Spirit. We're not alone. We're not abandoned. With open hands... If we're willing to let go of what we currently have in our hands, with open hands, the same Spirit that guided these two will guide us today. Now, I'm going to tell you, sometimes we behave as if we don't really believe that. But the same Spirit that prompted this story is alive and well in us, and I believe that is good news. Amen? It's worth paying attention to what is currently in our hands, what we may be, have our hands fastened to, and before the Holy Spirit say, Lord, would you teach me to trust your will, your way, more than whatever it is that I'm holding on to? Uh, Because what Jesus brings is good news for the world over and for us. Uh, Lord, teach us to trust you. Even as we look at this story And your love that you have poured out on us, Lord, I pray that that trust for you would grow in each of us. Lord, help us open our hands. Teach us to prefer what you want and will before and above anything that we might select for ourselves. Thank you for planting within us your holy Spirit, Lord, help us to follow your leading. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.